What is going on guys? Hope you're doing awesome. Roll that intro and then let's do some RNNs and shit. All right, so I got the usual imports that we normally have. Uh, this is for ignoring the TensorFlow messages that can be quite annoying, although we'll still get error messages. And then TensorFlow, Keras uh, layers to construct our layers, and then the MNIST data set. Uh, and then uh, this is just so that the uh, if you have any trouble running on the GPU, these two lines will most likely help you. All right, so let's let's start with what we actually want to do. We're gonna start with loading our data set. So we're gonna do Xtrain, Y train and then X test Y test is equal to MNIST dot load data. Then we're gonna do X train equals X train as type uh, float 32. Currently it's float 64 just to save on some computation. We're gonna convert it and then we're gonna normalize by dividing by 255. So it's in between zero and one. And uh, let's do the same for the uh, the test set. So float 32 uh, divide by 255. So what we're doing here is that we have we have an image of 28 by 28 pixels. And uh, how this is going to work when we're going to send it in uh, to an RNN or a GRU or an LSTM, uh, we're going to do all three of those. But we're essentially going to view for each time step, you're going to sort of unroll uh, one row of the image at a time. So for a particular time step, let's say the first time step, it's going to take the first row of the image and send that in. And then for the second time step, it's going to take the second row and send that in. And uh, just to be clear, you wouldn't use sequence models to handle images. It's not the best uh, model for it. You would use a comnet uh, that we covered uh, two videos ago. But it works to use RNNs. And as we'll see, we'll get reasonable performance. Uh, although this is more to illustrate how you would actually uh, implement an RNN uh, and a GRU and LSTM in TensorFlow. Uh, and the data set is not the optimal one, but we're just picking in a simple one to illustrate this example. All right, so with that said, let's actually do our model. We're gonna do keras.sequential. Uh, we're gonna do model.add, and then uh, specify the input. In this case, we're gonna specify none and then 28. So why we're specifying none, none here is because we have a, we don't have to have a specific number of time step, right? So we have 28 pixels in each time step. Uh, and then in this case, we actually have 28 time step, but we don't have to specify that dimension. And then we're going to do model.add and then uh, layers.simplerNN. So that's just for a basic RNN. Uh, and then let's say 512 nodes. And then uh, in as an additional argument, we can do return sequences equals true so that uh, it's it's returning the output from each time step. And in that way, we can stack multiple RNN layers on top of each other. So the output from this RNN is going to be 512 uh, nodes and then return sequences. It's going to output uh, 512 for each time step. In this case, we're going to have 28 time steps. And then we can also do uh, activation. We can set it to ReLU. And then we can add another one. We can do model.add layers uh, simple RNN. And uh, let's do 512 again. And we're going to set activation equals ReLU. And then for the output layer, we're going to do model.add layers.dense and we're going to have 10 output nodes. So you would notice here uh, that we're not doing return sequences on the second uh, simple RNN. So here for the output, we don't have return sequences equals true, meaning that it's going to pass every time step and then at the last, uh, the last output of this uh, simple RNN here, we're going to take uh, a layer dense on top of that one and we're going to have 10 output nodes. Uh, let's do print model.summary first. So as we can see here on the model.summary, for this first RNN, we're going to have none, none, and then 512. So we're going to have 512 output nodes, and then we're going to have for each time step here. And the reason that we have none and none is that we have the first one for the batches or uh, 
one of these are for the batches and one of them are for the hidden states. I think this this one is for the batches. This one is for the hidden states. And then at the second one, we're not having return sequences equals true. So we only have none for the batches. And then we have 512 nodes from uh, sort of the last hidden state when it's passed all of the, the inputs. And then at the end, we just have a layer on top of that one. So all that's left now is for us to do model.compile and uh, we're going to specify our loss function, keras.losses, sparse, categorical, uh, cross entropy. And then we're going to set from logits equals true because we do not have a softmax uh, on our uh, dense layer at the end. And then optimizer, we're going to do keras.optimizers.adam. Uh, and let's set the learning rate to 0.01. And then metrics, we're just going to keep track of the accuracy. All that's left now is for us to do model that fit on the training set and then specifying the batch size, let's say 64. And then let's run for 10 epochs and uh, verbose equals two, two just for uh, printing every epoch. And then at the end, we want to do an evaluation on our test set. So we're going to send an X test and then the labels Y test. We're also going to specify the batch size 64 and then again verbose equals equals two. All right, so let's run that and see if this works. All right, so after 10 epochs, we got 98% on the on the training set and almost 98% on the test set as well. Um, I just want to say here that we used an activation in Relu. Uh, the default when training re uh, recurrent networks is that you use 10H. So I don't know if that would work better in this case, but anyways, just wanted to mention that. So if you wouldn't specify an activation function, it would default be 10H when uh, when building these recurrent ne nets. So uh, also one thing here is that it took a little bit longer than I thought to run this. So let's just use 256. Uh, for our next models. So what we want to do now is uh, pretty much the same thing, but we want to build a, a GRU instead. And uh, all we got to do to do that is uh, we just got to change this, uh, this simple RNN to a GRU. And uh, that's pretty much it. That's all you have to do. So if we now rerun that, we can see uh, what it gets. And uh, I guess this is not really a, uh, a fair comparison, uh, but GRU should perform better than simple RNNs although now we're using half of the units and then we're using 10h instead of relu but the point is not really to compare the two just uh see that it works uh and uh see and show you how to use simple rnn uh, gru and then lstm uh, which is quite simple as well we're just going to change this to an lstm but anyways then i also want to show you how to do a bi-directional uh, layer All right, so after 10 epochs, we get 99.5% on the training and we get close to 99% on the test set, which is quite good actually. Uh, it's a two layered GRUs with 256 units. I mean, to get that is uh, pretty decent actually. So uh, let's now change this to, to an LSTM and uh, see if it's any improvement. So uh, LSTMs and GRUs are equivalent in terms of performance. I think LSTMs are a little bit better than GRUs, uh, but let's see if that's the case on this data set. All right, so it seems that we get pretty much the identical performance. Um, LSTMs were a little bit better perhaps on the test set, but uh, pretty much the same. So what we want to do now is we want to add, instead of using just a one directional LSTM, we want to use a um, bi-directional and uh, it's pretty easy to add that as well we're just going to do layers dot bi-directional and uh, yeah let's do it like this and then like this so we're just going to add layers dot bi-directional and then we're going to send in that lstm layer uh, and uh, let's do that for the second one or rather let's do all right so let's let's uh, first do mo print model dot summary and just see how it looks like all right, so I'm not going to let this train. So what we get here is, uh, as you can see, since we added this layer bidirectional, we're going to get 512 nodes instead of this 256. 
So what it's doing here is we're specifying the number of nodes uh, for each hidden for each uh, of its computation for each hidden state uh, in the LSTM to be 256 nodes. But since we add this bidirectional, we're going to have one going forward and one going backwards. So this is going to get doubled in the amount of nodes as we see here. So what we can do then is uh, for the second one, we can do also a let's see, layers dot bidirectional and then we can add that right there and that's also going to have 512 nodes uh, so let's run that and see if the bidirectional is uh, any better than the just one direction uh, the just having one direction on the lstm after 10 epochs we see that the performance is uh, about the same as just using one direction so the bidirectional didn't really help and uh and I'm not really sure why that is. Maybe it just needs more training or it just doesn't help that much uh, for this particular data set. But in general, uh, using bidirectional as more of a default is uh, a good option. But anyways, that was the basics of how to do a simple RNN, a GRU, LSTM, and then also how to add bidirectionality. And in this scenario, we use the MNIST data set. So we made it very easy for ourselves when using the MNIST data set. And when training on more complex data, you need to think about more things such as padding the data and masking the data uh, for each batch. And we're going to cover that in future videos when we're going to load more complex data and loading more custom data sets. Uh, so with that said, uh, thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.